Everyone, we are about to start in two minutes. All right, everyone, please take a seat. We are about to start. Right, we're ready. Welcome, welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us in this uh, annual event. I'm Professor Kalpani from Diagnostic Medical Imaging. Uh, every year we get together here and all different departments of SOAP get a chance to learn, uh, experience learning about and from each other to enable collaboration and improve patient outcome. This is a very important event as you'll get to experience this when you go, when you graduate and you go out there in, the cl in clinicals and you start your career, you will have to collaborate and, and know how to communicate with diff different departments, different specialties, so you can better help the patients. So this is called interdisciplinary uh, event or interprofessional event. And it really takes a village to help patients um, from different uh, disciplines. So today's agenda, we're done with the registration. We have an introduction. We're going to present the case study. Each discipline will talk about their studies. Then you get to work together and discuss the case. We're going to have some questions, and then we're going to wrap up. Before we start with the case presentation, I really want to welcome our SOAP Dean uh, Lewis, um, Alan Lewis for some welcoming words. So please, let's welcome Dean Lewis. Thank you, Professor Kalpani. Thank you very much. So um, greetings and welcome to our annual event uh, in a professional case study roundtable event. Um, We've been doing this event now, I think, for six years. Uh, we've missed a year with COVID, but we've been doing it. That would be seven if we'd done it that year. So six years we've been doing this. So this is a school of health professionals tradition. And as we've done it over the years, we certainly have improved it. And now we have participation from the College of Medicine, thanks to Dean Laurie Escalier, and the School of Public Health, thanks to Dean uh, DeMacy. So um, the purpose of this event is to expose students to both the idea of working collaboratively and working across discipline lines, because that's what you'll be doing in the real world, uh, working on teams. And the colleague next to you on your team may not have the same disciplinary background that you do. So this is a great opportunity to begin to learn some of those skills um, as you go forward and get ready for graduation. So today we have uh, at least registered, we have 160 plus students. Uh, about half of those are participating virtually via Zoom. And we also have the ones in this room. So, you know, we're taking advantage of technology and um, maximizing our attendance by using both, both um, ways of getting at people. Um, and again, we have students from health professions from the six disciplines there and nursing and public health. We, this kind of an event takes a lot of coordination to pull it together. You know, the case study has to be developed. You know, the students have to be invited. So it takes a, a village really to make it happen. And so I want to offer, take this opportunity to offer thanks to, uh, in addition to Deans Escalier and Demisi for from medicine and, and health and uh, public health. I want to thank Classroom Services and New Media Services, our technology folks. Uh, special thanks to Assistant Dean Philip Bones, who um, spearheads this effort, as well as the other um, staff in this Dean's office in the School of Health Professions, um, as well as the Interprofessional uh, Roundtable, Case Study Roundtable Planning of, um, Committee. And that's a lot of people. Um, Dr. Hari from Physical Therapy, Dr. Kalpani, who was up here just before me from Diagnostic Medical Imaging, Dr. Kamacha Rivera from Public Health, 
Dr. Condon from Midwifery and Health Professions, uh, Ms. Jackson, uh, Franchon Jackson, Professor St. Hilaire from Physician Assistant, uh, Dr. Bradby from College of Nursing, and Dr. Brewington from OT in the School of Health Professions. So as you can see, it takes quite an effort to pull this off. We're happy to do it because we want to make sure you have exposure to working in teams and working with folks who are in different, who have different backgrounds than you uh, around a very thorny and ultra-challenging clinical case. So students, enjoy the time today. These kind of situations like you'll be doing today will be commonplace once you get out of downstate and begin your clinical uh, careers. So get used to it. Um, and again, the idea is to collaborate across discipline-based lines with colleagues who have different backgrounds, but together you have all, pretty much have all the answers. And have, it, have fun today and enjoy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dean. Uh, without further ado, I want to welcome uh, Professor Condon. She's going to remind you what the case is about again, so then we can discuss this further later. And after, the, after she presents the case, each department will have six minutes to talk about their, to give their presentations, and then we'll move on to discussion. Condon. Thank you. Welcome, everybody. I'm happy to welcome all of you virtually and in person. It's great to have you here. Uh, looking forward to a lively discussion. Before I present the case, I want to talk a little bit about why this case, because I think it's really important for us to kind of pan back and look at the big picture. So a couple of points. Uh, for one thing, we have someone with a very intersectional situation. We have a middle-aged woman of color, and uh, this is a population that is often sort of dismissed. Um, sometimes there are concerns that people might feel awkward or uncomfortable bringing to a provider. And sometimes they may want to talk about it with a provider, but they may not know that anything can be done about it. So they don't bring it up. And if we as clinicians don't ask the questions when we're taking a history and trying to really listen and hone in on people's concerns, then we're missing opportunities to really, really help them and to improve their quality of life. Uh, I work a lot with this population, this age group, and it's a very, very common problem where people have gone to provider after provider after provider, and either they didn't feel comfortable opening up about intimate concerns, um, or they uh, just assumed it was normal and decided not to talk about it. So why does that matter? In a way, it matters because it can be a missed opportunity at this age. You know, many of you will be working at sites and in situations where you're working with people who are much older than our friend JT, who are in residential facilities or who are isolated and um, really don't have access to care that could help them with these kinds of concerns and complaints and situations. So if we intervene when symptoms like these first present themselves, not only are we improving the quality of life for people in the moment, but we're also potentially providing preventive care down the road. So that is some of the reason why we, we looked at this particular case. And as you can see in the case of JT, she did bring it to her primary care provider who just dismissed her symptoms as a sequelae of having had previous surgery, which, while it may be true, doesn't mean that there's nothing we can do about it. So uh, without further ado, we'll just introduce the, the case at hand. So JT is a healthy 58-year-old heterosexual African-American cisgendered woman who lives in our neighborhood here in Flatbush. Um, she presents to her primary care provider with worsening symptoms after becoming sexually active with a new intimate partner. So her symptoms had started previously, and when she brought them to her PCP, as I said, um, it was just assumed that this was a consequence of having had pelvic surgery in the past, and no further investigation was, was done. No further inquiry, no testing, no further physical examination. So now her symptoms are getting worse. Uh, she describes her chief concern as bulging and pressure, particularly after sexual activity, has some intermittent lower back pain, 
And sometimes she has what we call urge incontinence, which is when you have trouble making it to the bathroom to void your bladder. Um, when she is having penetrative intercourse, she finds it's difficulty, difficult to empty her bladder afterward. And because of that, because this is new and it's getting worse, she's worried that something is terribly wrong. Um, her history. So she has a pretty straightforward medical history, nothing but mild hypertension treated with lisinopril. Surgically, she had an appendectomy as a child, and she had this hysterectomy. So if we jump to her OBGYN history, we see that she has had no, no pregnancies um, and that she had surgical menopause at the age of 53, which means that her menopause was a consequence of having her uterus removed. Uh, her uterus was removed because she had very heavy bleeding with her periods because she had fibroids in her uterus, which is a fairly common finding for folks with fibroids. And because of the very heavy menstrual bleeding, she had severe anemia, which of course could impact your quality of life significantly if you feel tired and short of breath all the time, right? So she had that hysterectomy. Uh, family history, not really contributory to this situation. Her mother had sickle cell trait and uh, hypertension as well, died at 72 from a stroke. Her father was insulin dependent, uh, now deceased because of diabetic complications, but she has one sister who is doing quite well. Socially, her, uh, her husband died when she was 55. Now she has a new partner. Uh, she occasionally socially drinks. She's a non-smoker. And um, she wasn't sexually active, this is important, from the time that her husband died, so that was three years prior, uh, until now when she's with this new partner. So some of the sexual symptoms are obviously new because she's in, in a new relationship. Um, and she's engaging in oral and vaginal penetrative intercourse and using water-based lubricant. So her diagnosis is pelvic or organ prolapse. Uh, and while this is a common uh, event in people with hysterectomy or after menopause or even people who've just recently had a baby, um, it doesn't mean that nothing can be done to help. So just to review again, on the far left, you see the uterus and the bladder and the rectum sort of properly poised one in front of the other, uh, the way we like them to be with some space in between them. Cystocele is a prolapse of the bladder. So you can see that on the left side there where it's, where it's labeled. Uterine prolapse is when the uterus comes down between the rectum and the bladder. And erectocele is what we call it when the, uh, the rectum has prolapsed. And there's another one called enterocele, which is a little more complicated and not um, involved in this slide. But basically, you can look at uh, both fascial and pelvic floor muscle um, issues and scar tissue that could contribute to this. But there are so many things that we can do to help, and that's what we're here to do. So, passing it back to you. All right. Thank you, Condon, for um, giving us a review of the case. Now, as Condon said, all departments have something to contribute to this case and for this patient. So, let's invite health informatics, presenters from health informatics um, department to introduce what they do and what they can contribute for the case. Let me check if we have... Okay. Okay. You can use this or this, whichever you want. Just make sure you're close. You can move it. Okay. Hello, everyone. My name is Stacy Hyman, and I'm a part of the Health Informatics Program. <clears throat> can you hear me? If I sound nervous, it's because I'm nervous. This is not my strength. So, okay. No, I'm fine. I'm fine with it this way. Okay. So, okay, so I'm Stacy Hyman. I'm a part of the Health Informatics program. And what is Health Informatics? So Health Informatics is a multidisciplinary field or an interprofessional field that utilizes technology and data analysis to improve healthcare delivery and patient outcomes. It is also involved in clinical decision support, health information management, telemedicine, electronic
using technology to assist in retrieving, organizing, and analyzing associated health information. So I wanted to share an example of a patient health chart designed by health informaticians. So I'm sure everyone has a patient chart. So it's actually the health informaticians that help to design these interfaces in a user-friendly way to improve the accuracy, efficiency, and accessibility of healthcare information. They help healthcare providers to have access to health data so they can make informed decisions. And these patient charts are also very valuable to patients. This is just a depiction of the ways information interacts with patients and clinicians. And I thought this would be good to share because information is critical in patient-centered care. And the field of health informatics has evolved in recent years to focus on how information is acquired, stored, and used in healthcare with a particular emphasis on technology. So in this diagram, I'll try to make it quick. The pink arrow, the use of informatics to integrate physician knowledge, data resources combined with patient information to improve patient care. The dark blue arrow is showing how informatics created mechanism to transfer critical patient information to clinicians. The orange line is showing how information from patient to family and friends and to other patients are shared among each other. Example, the Medline Plus. The dotted plumb lines, multiple care teams receiving critical information between different clinicians. The dashed light blue lines is how low quality information is shared among patients. So sometimes the information is not always accurate that we get from our patients. And sometimes information from clinicians to clinicians is not always accurate also. But the lavender arrow shows how clinicians direct patients to appropriate information resources. So in conclusion, health informatics plays many roles in contributing to management and care of patients. So in clinical decision support system, the tool in health informatics provide decision support to medical personnel with access to alerts, depending on the patient's medical history, symptoms, and current medication. In this case study, the CDSS would prompt the clinician to rethink dismissing the patient's symptoms based on surgical history and to investigate further. Telemedicine informaticians would enable telehealth consultation, which is helpful in this case study, as the patient could get some guidance from the provider regarding hygiene steps after intercourse to eliminate symptoms until they can visit a doctor for further examination. In the case of electronic health record, informaticians simplify the organization and management of patients' medical records providing family history, lifestyle habits, examples being a smoker, medical history, and surgical history. This ensures that all pertinent health data is accessible to the providers. And lastly, patient education. Information tools also support patient education, providing access to educational health material and electronic communication tools to ask the provider questions where necessary. So that's just a brief synopsis of what the informaticians would do in, in a case like this. Thank you. Thank you. Let's give it up for health informatics. Now it's time to learn what the physician assistant's role is. So I'd like to welcome presenters from the physician assistant program. I just, you're going to hear me reminding you about the time. I just, it's just because I want to have enough time for the discussion. So six minutes and, okay. Hi, my name is Jadia. I am a senior in the PA program and here are my lovely classmates and friends and I would like them to introduce themselves. Hi, I'm Alif. Hello, my name is Aisha Amjad. Nice to meet you all. <laughs> okay. So... 
PAs are licensed clinicians who practice medicine in every specialty and setting, rigorously educated and trained healthcare professionals. PAs are dedicated to expanding access to care and transforming health and wellness through patient-centered and team-based medical practice. Before going to the next slide, I would like to say that we are not assistants to physicians. We manage our own patients. We were just named physician assistant in 1967, but now in 2021, House of Delegates passed our name change to physician associates. So what do we do, right? So we take medical histories, we conduct phys physical exam, we diagnose and treat illnesses, order, interpret tests, develop and treatment plans, we prescribe medications, schedule two to five, and we counsel on preventative care perform procedures, assist in surgery, make rounds in hospital and nursing homes, and do clinical research. Places where PAs can be found, we do, um, work in hospitals, outpatient settings, clinics, urgent cares, um, and even in rural places. Um, specialties that you will find PAs is OBGYN, um, hematology, ENT, internal medicine, pediatrics, surgery, and sub specialties of surgery like orthopedics or neurosurgery. And there's other um, specialties I did not mention, but if there's a place for a PA um, for us to be there, we'll likely take the job. Okay, so now I will um, pass it on to my to Aisha. Hello. Thank you, Jadia, for insightful introduction to PA profession. Um, as Judea mentioned, we PA work across numerous medical fields. Um, so in this particular case, uh, we know that she presented with symptoms of pelvic organ prolapse, which were initially dismissed by her primary care provider. In this role, now I will be wearing the hat of her PCP, um, and I will offer her my expertise in history taking, physical examination, to come up with a treatment plan that will ensure best possible outcomes for her. And, to, uh, and a sustainable lifestyle. All right, thank you. Um, as a PA, for me, knowing these risk factors is really important. Her OBGYN history of hysterectomy and being postmenopausal already put her at increased risk of pelvic organ uh, and uh, dysfunction and pelvic floor weakness. So knowing this, I will move on to her clinical presentation, which includes her urinary symptoms, as mentioned earlier by Dr. Condon, and her pain symptoms. Uh, as a clinician, now it's my job to further investigate her uh, condition by asking her more questions. And in this case, I will ask her about her rectal symptoms, such as, are you having constipation? Are you having fecal urgency? Are you having bowel leakage or rectal fullness? Why? Because this will help me to understand what kind of prolapse she might be having. So knowing this as a PCP, I will perform physical examination on her, uh, starting from visual inspection, speculum exam, and then by manual pelvic exam to identify pelvic organ prolapse. And now Elif will talk about the role of PA in management in this case. Um, so as a PA for this patient, we have an important role in managing her symptoms and offering her treatment. So we have the option of offering her conservative management or surgical management. Um, one thing that we can do conservatively is discussing and um, discussing reducing any modifiable risk factors. So the PA could play the role in educating the patient in this scenario, discussing weight loss, um, dietary changes, and smoking cessation if she is a smoker. Um, another thing that we could recommend are Kegel exercises, which are a form of pelvic floor muscle training. They're great at primary prevention of pelvic organ prolapse, but they can also aid in controlling any of her urinary incontinence symptoms. Um, additional form of management would be a vaginal pessary. So this is an image of what a pessary may look like. It's a device that is inserted into the vagina that is made to support the pelvic organs the PA would determine um, which pessary would be best appropriate for this patient and be able to fit them and educate them on how to properly insert them and remove them. If the patient is requiring surgical management, we would refer to another PA or provider um, that works in urology gynecology and see if they would be a candidate for any sort of reconstructive surgery, suspensory procedures, 
um, or obliterative surgeries. So basically for this patient, PAs can be involved throughout her case from start to the end. We can function as her primary care provider, the first person that they see for the problem, getting an accurate history and physical, and the initial diagnosis. We could be the PA that's managing them in ob or we could be part of the surgical team and act as the first assist for her surgical management. So that concludes our presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. We'll move on to midwifery. So presenters from midwifery, welcome to the stage. You want to? Hi, my name is Kathy Blaze. I'm one of the midwifery students. Melissa Rock. And I'm Mimi Samuels. So I just want to introduce of, uh, what midwives do. Uh, midwives provide both primary care as well as reproductive care to cisgender women, as well as transgender and non-binary individuals. Um, we also provide the scope of practice, which includes reproductive and pelvic organ health, as well as overall health and well-being. We are also trained and licensed to prescribe pharma, pharmacotherapeutics, as well as to fit and place contraceptive devices such as IUDs or internal structural support. Thank you. So the best model of healthcare includes the full scope of health across the lifespan. It involves a continuous and compassionate partnership between persons seeking care and their healthcare providers. Midwives recognize the importance of interdisciplinary collaborative care um, and respects the individual's absolute right to bodily autonomy. Midwives honor a person's expertise, life experiences, community, historical knowledge, which includes methods of care, healing, guided by research, and best available evidence centered on the individual's decisions, values, and preference. Vitalize also balances watchful waiting and support of physiologic processes with the appropriate use of interventions and technology, which can involve therapeutic use of human presence and skillful communication. So, um, thank you. <laughs> what we would do, so part of what midwives do is we provide both an empathetic but also a reassured presence in shared decision-making with our clients. Um, for JT, we would express our happiness at their new relationship. And so we would recognize that this is a new relationship after they their uh, husband passed away. Um, and so there might be some new questions, too, about experiences she's having in this relationship uh, in particular, of course, with the, the condition she presented in our office, which we would also get to. But we wanted to assure her that she can talk to us about what she's experiencing and that we are offering that, that ear to listen. We also want to make sure that she, um, even though she's already had a hysterectomy, we want to make sure that she's protecting herself um, against STIs, right, sexually transmitted infections. And so making sure to counsel her about that as well. Um, let's see. We want to then, um, after we do that, when we get to the point where we're actually investigating her chief complaint, what she's come to the office for, uh, we would uh, start with a speculum exam, um, to investigate uh, cystocele, rectocele, and teracele, what was mentioned earlier. And just to note here, right, so our patient, JT, does not have a uterus, right? So we're not necessarily looking at a uterine pro prolapse, but more of a possible bladder prolapse. Oh, yeah, thank you. Is there a highlighter? Yeah. Um, uh, but we're looking at possible cystocele or rectocele here. And so what we would do is we would do the speculum exam using one uh, of the, the lips of the speculum and ask her to, to bear down during that uh, experience to, to see if we notice any of um, kind of organ prolapse during that process. And then we would gauge the staging of that. So from stage zero, which basically says there is no evidence of kind of pelvic organ prolapse to stage five, which is much more severe. Um, 
then, but we would also make sure that we want to rule out anything else, right? That may be part of the problem, but it may not be the only issue that she's facing. And so we want also uh, refer uh, JT to imaging, right? To look at um, any other possible cysts or other causes um, that may be impacting her um, and her, you know, frequent feeling of urine, uh, urine incontinence. So urinary incontinence happens in about 50% of women over the course of their lifetime. And hysterectomy and advanced age increases the risk of pelvic organ prolapse, especially after menopause when estrogen levels are lower and tissue integrity is affected. So there are a few options for treatments ranging from surgery um, to more conservative options, such as estrogen creams, a pessary, or pelvic floor exercises. And we include the client in our decision whether she would want um, an estrogen-containing cream, such as Premarin, Estrace, Vagifem, or a, a vaginal ring, such as Estring, um, to help relieve symptoms that are caused by atrophied genitourinary tissue. And we need to normalize this because we need to explain that just like a person after a certain age has to use hand cream every day, um, at a certain age, a woman needs to moisturize her genital area as well. Um, and a pessary is a first-line conservative treatment. There are two types of pessaries. There's the support pessary and there's a fill-up-the-space pessary. So the support would be like the ring. Sorry. Okay. I'm not good at that. No, no, no. Okay. Like the ring or the ring with support. Or there's uh, the cube. I'm not good at this. <laughs> you can read it. Um, so the cube would fill up the space the gale horn, and that is not as comfortable. So sometimes even if there is a, um, uh, a more severe prolapse, a person might opt for a, um, a ring or support and then do pelvic floor exercises. And um, a midwife is able to fit the pessary. So she will assess um, the uh, prolapse by doing a bimanual exam. She'll try a certain size pessary and ensure that it's sitting comfortably behind the cervix and under the pubic notch and that it can unfold completely in the vaginal vault and that there's comfortably room to fit a finger between the vaginal wall and the pessary. So the client will then walk around and bear down and make sure that the pessary isn't moving. And the midwife can educate the client on hygiene and how to remove, clean, and reinsert the pessary. And then usually she'll come back within two weeks to assess, um, to follow up and assess her symptom relief. So a midwife can also counsel on nutrition and talk about vitamins that are important for tissue integrity, such as zinc, magnesium, and vitamin C. We could talk about the importance of prebiotics, probiotics, and fiber, which can help the client regularly move their bowels so they don't push or bear down on the and increase the bulging of the prolapse. And um, moving along, um, a 58 year old woman has life experience. She knows a lot about her body. So the first and most important thing is that we need to respect her intelligence. We need to ask open-ended questions and really listen to the client and what their experience has taught them. We need to hear and share about what they may have learned from friends and from social media. They may have heard about the importance of Kegels and weight-bearing exercises for their age group, but if they do them wrong, they might be aggravating the problem. So it's really important that they either go to a midwife who is um, trained in pelvic floor therapy or we will refer to a physical therapist that is trained in pe pelvic floor therapy. We also need to educate the client that the vagina is not the only organ involved in sex and there are other erogenous zones that can help with arousal. We need to explain that lubricants aren't a substitute for arousal and lubrication isn't necessarily a sign of arousal. If a person feels self-conscious or worried about discomfort, 
that can make it hard to be aroused and enjoy sex. So we need to listen to their needs and concerns, normalize their situation, educate them about their body, which empowers them to prioritize their own sexual pleasure and ask for what they need. Sometimes just being able to talk to someone who can listen, validate, and understand helps alleviate their worry, which can inhibit arousal. So to summarize... Um, to summarize, the mid midwifery model of care offers a full scope care that involves a continuous and compassionate partnership between persons seeking care and their health care provider. Midwives are trained to assess and offer non-surgical treatment for pelvic organ prolapse and positive collaboration referrals to specialists such as pelvic floor specialists aid in and support comprehensive health care throughout the life course. And of course, open and thoughtful communication about consensual sexual intimacy, STI protection, monogamy, and the physical and emotional needs of the persons engaging in sexual relationships give space for the patient, such as TJ, to, el to elevate or prioritize her own pleasurable experiences. Thank you very much. Uh, as uh, one of the presenters uh, suggested that they would like to order some images for the patient. Perfect timing, midwifery. I want to uh, welcome my students from Diagnostic Medical Imaging to talk about what Diagnostic Medical Imaging is and how we can contribute to this case. Okay. Hi, my name is Kayla. Um, I'm part of the Diagnostic Medical Imaging Program. Hi, my name is Cindy, and we're both seniors in the program. Okay, so about our program, um, we are a two-year bachelor program, and we, we study um, specifically ultrasound. We are ultra, ultra technologists. Um, so some of the exams that we perform, we do abdominal scans, we look at the liver, the kidney, pancreas, gallbladder, um, some vessels like the aorta and the IVC. We also perform obstetrics and gynecologic exams as well, so assessing the uterus, ovaries, bladder, um, echocardio echocardiogram exams as well for adult and pediatric echo, so looking at the heart. Neurosonography, so in some pediatric cases, we would examine for, for example, um, hydrocephalus, ventricular megaly. Um, we also do transcranial Doppler imaging, musculoskeletal exams. We will be assessing if there's any tears within the muscles and vascular exams, both upper and lower extremity arterial and venous exams, as well as carotids. So what is ultrasound and how does it work? So ultrasound uses sound waves to help visualize um, inside the human body. There are different transducers or probes that we utilize, which also have different frequencies in order to help us image these different structures. So we typically classify the frequencies in lower and higher frequency categories. For lower frequencies, this is typically what we will use to image structures that are deeper within the body or for obese patients. And for higher frequencies, this is what we would use for more superficial structures. And we also use a water-based gel. That is how we are able to see inside of the body. And the gel is going to be used as a medium in order to transport the sound waves into the body so that way we can assess those images. And here I'm going to have three examples, some pictures and um, exam examples. Here we have the aorta and sagittal and transverse. We can assess how the aorta looks. We can look for abdominal aneurysms. Or we can do mesenteric studies, like look at the SMA or the celiac. And this is the same, um, this is just in transverse. SMA, aorta, IVC, pancreas, we can look at these structures. Over here is an example of neurosonography. We can look at it for neonatal, um, for babies. Over here, we can look for hemorrhages. Here's the sagittal and transverse. And we can also assess how mature the brain is. We look at if there's much uh, grooves or if there's no grooves. And over here, it pertains to today's case study. We can have a translabial approach to sagittal, where we take a curved transducer or um, 
a linear transducer depending on the body habitus of the patient. And you can just look at this image and imagine it to be rotated counterclockwise to match the image on the right. We can look at the uterus, the bladder, um, even the rectum. And for today's case, or any pelvic organ prolapse case, we can look at all the structures. And then the left image is of uh, regular at rest. And then the second one is when they do Valsalva. So we can actually see what organ moves up or stays at um, their location. And for that, we can look for cystoceles or rectoceles or even um, uterus prolapse. And we have many names. We, can, we are called ultrasound technologists, or we are also called sonographers. And we are mainly imaging. We acquire diagnostic images that help physicians make a diagnosis, and we also make prelim preliminary reports. We have a lot of knowledge. We have to know what normal and abnormal organs look like. And we perform many exams, uh, real-time exams. For example, we evaluate blood flow, or we can do um, detailed anatomy exams for obstetrics. And lastly, ultrasound also does have a role um, as a point of care exam. So emergency medicine physicians, they typically utilize POCUS exams to rule out specific diagnosis. Um, some of the exams that they perform in the ER would be like RUSH or FAST exams in order for you to just get that quick diagnosis and get that patient into the ER um, and then into the operating room. Um, so these POCUS exams are portable, handheld um, they use portable handheld butterfly probes. Um, no radiation is involved. It's important to note that POCUS is not a substitute for typical ultrasound exams. Um, they should still be performed if it's possible. Uh, POCUS exams do have good accuracy. They help the physician to make quick decisions, for example, ruling out appendicitis, pneumothorax, and pleural effusions, to name a few, as well as musculoskeletal injuries like quadriceps, quadriceps tendon rupture. And that's oh. it. Thank you, DMI. Now it's time to hear from occupational therapy. Okay, welcome. Hi, everyone. This is Samaya. Giselle. And I'm Jenna. We're all second year students from the OT program. So just to jump right in, um, highlighting the OT's role in pelvic floor rehabilitation. So as OTs, we use a more holistic and client-centered approach to promote performance in the client's activities of daily living. Um, so essentially, put short, um, OT is really a natural fit for minimizing the effects of pelvic organ prolapse on daily occupations by incorporating interventions that promote healing, um, promote well-being, and essentially just prevent further harm. And we need to consider here that prolapse, pelvic organ prolapse, any type of pelvic floor dysfunction um, takes an emotional uh, toll, a physical toll, and essentially, you know, limits an individual's participation hindering on the quality of life that they're going to be experiencing. So we want to really emphasize on the psycholog psychological toll, um, really breaking down those barriers and normalizing conversation, not only just client to therapist, but also within their own personal lives as well. Um, so again, considerations of the social stigma, as this is a shameful topic, so you need to reshame their frames of thinking uh, from a more social perspective to promote participation and engagement. Also, um, additional treatments include preparatory activities such as man manual therapies, biofeedback, which is more of a mind-body technique, uh, learning to relax some muscles while contracting others, um, therapeutic exercises, so you're strengthening pelvic floor muscles, enhancing flexibility and elasticity, and of course, coordination between the pelvic floor and the pelvic diaphragm. Uh, functional activities, behavioral strategies such as relaxation and pain management, mindfulness techniques, um, managing medication, planning schedules, all the great things that we could help with as OTs, uh, more education, environmental strategies, um, where we see fit. Okay, so going into the pelvic floor or also the pelvic uh, diaphragm, 
We have a lot of intricate muscles here, ligaments and tissues that support vital organs, um, which we kind of went over before, highlighting the urogenital triangle. So really just differentiating between the anterior portion and the posterior portion. And when we're talking to our clients, we like to refer to it as a hammock or a bowl, just so they could better visualize what exactly is happening down there. And again, facilitating that mind-body connection. Um, and then really just incorporating inefficient breathing um, highlighting the fact that inefficient breathing really impacts function of pelvic floor muscles. So you want to learn how to coordinate the mind-body and the pelvic diaphragm with the pelvic floor. So how we do this, and we could even do this in our everyday lives, you want to incorporate the pelvic breath. So what's happening here is when we're inhaling, the diaphragm and the pelvic floor is essentially descending or moving outward. And when you exhale, the, del the diaphragm and the pelvic floor is ascending. So this promotes more efficient breathing strategies, um, which could promote more energy, calmer and clearer perspective, reduce tension, and also ease movement qualities. So the main focus here is seeing that pelvic floor dysfunction equals respiratory dysfunction. So you want to connect the two diaphragms. So um, given JT's chief complaints, her diagnosis of pelvic organ prolapse, um, the urinary incontinence that she experienced, her medication, the Sinopril, which is an ACE inhibitor um, that has been linked with urinary incontinence, and the fact that 60% of women are diagnosed with um, urinary incontinence along with pelvic organ prolapse, occupational therapy interventions can be considered. Um, as Jenna has mentioned, education is a significant intervention. When it comes to urge incontinence, controlled intake of liquids during the day and nighttime can be considered. Um, when it comes to engaging in sexual activity, urine, urinary voiding can be recommended. And when it comes to medication management, assessing the impact of hypertension medications on incontinence um, can be addressed by following up with the doctor on potential adjustments that can be made to the med medication schedule. Um, Breathing or exhaling with movement, as mentioned by Jenna, can be used to um, decrease the intra-abdominal pressure and avoiding exercises that increase this pressure can also be considered. Since the core muscles and the pelvic floor work together, as mentioned previously, core strength training can be done to decrease the exacerbation of symptoms. And when it comes to sexual activity, understanding of the sympathetic Sympathetic system can help with self-regulation techniques such as pelvic breathing before and after sexual activity, which helps to relax the muscles. All right, so some of the functional activities that we can address with JT are toileting and everyday tasks such as picking up heavy groceries from the floor. In both circumstances, we want to make sure that JT is using pursed lipped breathing to promote exhalation capacities with a hip hinge motion when squatting down. When squatting down, we want JT to breathe in slowly while pushing back the hips behind the knees, making sure to keep the back in alignment and elongated. JT should only do what is manageable when going down to not exasperate the muscles as they are meant to be relaxing in this position. As JT slowly stands up, she needs to exhale slowly, which is contracting the pelvic floor muscles. Some therapeutic activities that we will also be doing with JT, as mentioned before, is the diaphragm diaphragmatic breathing or the pelvic breaths, which is to calm the nervous system. So in sitting, we're going to have the hand above the belly button. We're going to breathe in. We want the hand to be filled with our stomach. When we're breathing out, we want to feel the stomach making its way back towards the spine. For JTN specifically, when she's in supine, we want when she's inhaling to relax the vagina down and out so that the pelvic floor goes down toward the feet. When she's exhaling, we want her to feel the to close the vagina and lift front of the hammock, as mentioned before, so pelvic floor comes back up again towards the head. Another one that we will be doing is bladder retraining, which is the timed voiding schedule. This should start bladder retraining, retraining if the urination is shorter than 10 seconds and, occur, and occurs more frequently to address urge incontinence. And this works to increase time interval, intervals between urination periods between three and four hours. And this is just a little visual representation. So we don't really want her to be squatting this wide as this is really meant for the posterior muscles, which is also good because she does have that rectal prolapse. But we want her to more focus on the more narrow, more standard-like um, squatting and to not really go so far deep down to not cause any pain or harm towards her.
Okay, thank you very much. A reminder, we have around 15 minutes left and we have three presentations. Five minutes. Physical therapy. Who is okay. I want to give you guys time to talk and answer some questions later. Hi guys, thank you for being patient. We promise to make this quick. So my name is Andrew. I'm a second year PT student. Uh, my name is Matt. I'm also a second year PT student. Uh, so as far as physical therapy, uh, we are a doctorate profession. Uh, we can work in a variety of uh, locations, inpatient, outpatient, typically uh, nursing homes, various things like that. Uh, but typically, we are going to diagnose movement dysfunctions and then develop a treatment plan to help our patients feel better. Uh, so in this case, we're looking at musculoskeletal impairments. Uh, one thing that no one has quite mentioned yet is that our patient does have intermittent lower back pain. So that's something that we would like to address as well as their uh, pelvic floor dysfunctions. Uh, and then we're also looking at functional limitations. So their bladder problems and even having uh, sexual dysfunction. Uh, as far as physical therapy, we uh, have a number of specialties. Uh, so when we graduate, we are... Um, basically get a little bit of each of those professions, and then we can uh, specialize further uh, once we graduate. So to become a pelvic health PT, it actually does require continuing education after you graduate, uh, and that's the kind of PT specialty we would look for uh, for this case. So as I mentioned, they receive additional training uh, in pelvic floor anatomy, physiology, examination, and treatment procedures. Uh, and Pelvic floor PTs will typically address pelvic floor weakness, urinary or fecal incontinence, and perennial healing. All right, as mentioned previously by uh, my peers here, uh, Ms. Jones, she has a diagnosis of uh, uh, organ prolapse. Despite this, uh, as PTs and expert clinicians, we want to make a thorough and detailed examination and evaluation. So here uh, listed below are our top concerns as PTs. The first and foremost being urinary and fecal incontinence, followed by urinary retention, following sexual penetration, uh, possible pain and discomfort when she's um, engaging in intimate activities. Um, her goals are returning to activities after a hysterectomy and a long hiatus. So we have three years following her husband's death, um, intermittent lower back pain, and fear avoidance beliefs. So when we uh, meet this patient, part of our examination process, we're going to want to know what the mechanism of injury might be. Uh, and pelvic floor PTs, they'll, do, they'll conduct an internal examination. So you want to know what layer of the pelvic floor um, might need to be addressed. Uh, and during that internal examination, they can also um, take a look at the pelvic floor musculature in particular. And so we want to determine uh, which layer so we know exactly what muscles or techniques to address. Uh, so I also included a visual diagram here that also talks about the core musculature as well. So we also want to look at the, uh, the abdomen and the back muscles as well as the pelvic floor because our patient also expressed that they have some lower back pain. And the research does show that there is a high correlation between lower back pain and pelvic floor dysfunction. Uh, so also part of the examination would then be the hip, back, and core, for which we'd be looking at their range of motion. Uh, we also know that if you have tighter hips, that can increase stress on the lower back. And then MMT, which is manual muscle testing, so you want to see and make sure those muscles are also fairly strong. Okay, so we have a long list of interventions for uh, Mrs. Jones specifically. I'm just going to go through the main ones. Uh, first and foremost, we're going to utilize pelvic floor PT to work on the levator ani. This is the primary muscle, uh, muscle layer that supports the pelvic organs. Um, so we would work on reduction of the inner hole for uh, possible prolapse and stimulation of blood flow following the menopause. Uh, we would also work on connective tissue manipulation and myofascial release along with neuromobilization. Uh, this encompasses uh, relaxing and mobilizing uh, the structures in, uh, immediately surrounding the nerves and sliding and gliding nerves so that during dynamic movements, this patient will experience less discomfort and pain. Uh, last and foremost, we have uh, biofeedback devices, including functional e electric stimulation. And um, 
Also, home exercise plans and lifestyle modifications. So pictured here, uh, we have um, a woman on a Therex ball, and um, it emphasizes that uh, this one right here. So we don't necessarily have to um, do a surgical, proce surgical procedure. Um, say Mrs. Jones is having uh, pain um, when um, engaging in some activities. We can, uh, uh, can encourage Mrs. Jones to switch a position or perhaps use uh, sort of ramps or slings so that there's less pain. Uh, um, also ADO training and modification of her environment. So after Mrs. Jones is discharged from a clinic, um, we want to uh, refer her to outpatient health and wellness centers uh, because um, our progress is with, with Ms. Jones, um, if she doesn't use it, she's going to lose it. So uh, we want to further educate her and refer her to um, health centers so that she can maintain the progress she's made in our PC clinic. Okay, thank you very much. Great job. Uh, you can have a seat. Next, I want to invite nursing program. Mary, is it just one or? Ah, okay. Thank you, thank you. So, yeah. Hey guys, my name is Mary. I'm one of the. <laughs> There she is. Um, one of the students from the FMP and DMP program. Hi, I'm Juliana. I'm in the DMP program for Women's Health. We're actually going to be talking about the differences of role in scope of practice for RNs and advanced practice nurses. So in New York State, the definition of an RN is someone who can perform a health assessment, diagnose and treat patients' unique responses to diagnose health problems, they can teach and counsel patients about their health and execute medical regimens as prescribed by the licensed physicians, dentists, NPs, PAs, and podiatrists. And they can also contribute as members of interdisciplinary healthcare teams and health-related committees to plan and implement healthcare. A registered professional nurse is a licensed health professional who helps patients to achieve optimal health and prevent disease or injury. RNs provide compassionate care that is respectful for each patient's values and wishes. They coordinate and supervise care provided by other personnel, such as licensed practical nurses or home health aides. RNs provide health teachings to patients, families, and other providers and the public. They participate in health research and in making healthcare policies. RNs make nursing assessments, nursing diagnosis, and they also plan, implement, and evaluate nursing care. RNs do not make medical diagnoses or prescribe medical treatments or drugs. RNs work in a variety of settings such as hospitals, nursing homes, community residences, mental health facilities, clinics, private practices, surgery centers, you can basically name it, they work everywhere. In clinics, uh, RNs take health histories and perform physical examinations to identify and address health problems and unmet patient care needs. In nursing homes, they develop nursing care plans to manage the nursing care of their residents. In hospitals, they administer, administer the medications and provide medical care as prescribed by the doctor, dentist, NP, PA, midwife, and podiatrist. In hospice programs, RNs help patients and their families cope with and manage serious illnesses by providing emotional support and health teachings. RNs provide mental health counseling to patients and their families to promote healthy behaviors. In county health departments, schools, and health fairs, RNs perform health screenings to detect risk factors or early signs of diseases and then provide health teaching or make referrals as appropriate. They also work closely with patients, families, caregivers, and other health practitioners to provide well-coordinated individualized care in home and community settings. Okay. RNs are called to create and sustain healthy work environments. The AACN, the American Association for Crit Care Nurses, has six standards for establishing and sustaining healthy work environments. Uh, present evidence-based and relationship-centered principles for the professional performance. Nurses are called to action to address these standards as they are vital to achieving the most effective interpersonal professional collaborative practice and care outcomes. Skilled communication. Nurses mu must be proficient in communication skills as they are clinical skills. True collaboration. Nurses must be relentless in pursuing and fostering true collaboration. 
Effective decision-making. Nurses must be valued and committed partners in making policy, directing and evaluating clinical care, and leading to organizational operations. Appropriate staffing. Staffing must be ensured the effective match between the patient's needs and the nurse competencies. Meaningful recognition. Nurses must be recognized <clears throat> and must recognize others for the value each brings to the work for the organization. Authentic leadership. Nurse leaders must fully embrace the imperative of a healthy work environment, um, authenticatingly live it, and engage others in its achievements. Role and scope of nurse <clears throat> of practice for NPs. The definition of a nurse practitioner are registered nurses who have completed advanced clinical education to become certified in one or more specialty areas. NPs may diagnose, treat, and prescribe for a patient's conditions that falls within their specialty areas. A nurse practitioner is an RN who has completed advanced nursing education, usually a master's in art or doctorate degree, and is certified by the New York State Education Department as certified nurse practitioner. NP um, or nurse practitioner in a specialty area of practice. An NP is also referred <clears throat> to as an advanced practice nurse, an APN or an APRN. Um, NPs diagnose and treat illnesses and other health problems that fall within the specialty area of practice in which the NP is certified. The New York State Education Department certifies NP to practice in all of these specialty areas. Everything is listed down below. All right. So NPs may prescribe medical tests and treatments like x-rays, tests, drugs um, to perform a variety of medical um, procedures and minor surgical procedures. They provide health counseling and coordinate and supervise patient uh, care delivered by other personnel, such as RNs and LPNs. They engage in clinical research and they make health policy. Like RNs and NPs practice in broad range in healthcare and community settings. Many of them have admitting clinical privileges at hospitals and other health facilities. NPs work with physicians and other health professionals to ensure that patients receive appropriate, timely, and well-coordinated care. They also consult with physicians and other healthcare practitioners regarding their patients, as well as provide clinical consultations to other healthcare practitioners. And they also identify when their patients require further evaluation and specialized care and make the appropriate referrals. Thank you. Okay. Last but not least, public health. Oh, we have five minutes. <laughs> We're on time. We're on time. <laughs> you want to? Good afternoon, everyone. I am Janiel Williams, and I'm a DRPH candidate in School of Public Health, Epidemiology major. And today I'll be looking at public health considerations in interprofessional education. <laughs> So first, before we go ahead, we need to kind of understand what public health is. So one of the leading figures in the development of modern study of public health, Charles Winslow, he defines public health as the science and art of preventing disease, prolonging life, and promoting health through the organized efforts and informed choices of society, organizations, public and private communities, and individuals. individuals. The mission of public health. So the Institute of Medicine basically has a mission. Their mission is basically to fulfill society's interests and in assuring conditions in which people can be healthy. Their mission is also supported by that of the World Health Organization, which basically speaks of public health aims to provide maximum benefit for the largest number of people. With that being said, we should look at the essential, the 10 essential public health services. Now, the 10 essential public health services fall under three core functions. Firstly, assessment. What do we want to do? We want to monitor the health status. From that, we go ahead and we make a diagnosis, and then we investigate. Then now we move on to a policy development. Policy development in there, we want to inform, educate, and empower our people. Then we want to mobilize community partnerships develop policies, and then we move into the last phase of assurance. In assurance, we're going to enforce those laws and those policies that we've developed. We're going to link to provide care, um, provide linkages to care, and then we're also going to assure a competent workforce 
And to ensure that all that we've done is working, we need to evaluate. And once we evaluate, then we will come up with new research and the cycle continues. So essentially, it's a, pub it's a cycle. Public health is a cycle of assessment, policy development, and assurance. So most of you here, based on your presentations, you will fall under healthcare as clinicians, but healthcare and public health were complementary to each other. So the difference, we do have a few differences. So for example, healthcare focuses on individual patient, for individual patient, personal service ethic, um, diagnosis and treatment emphasis. However, on the other hand, as public health pr practitioners, we focus on the population together. Um, we look at public health ethic, and we also look at prevention or public health emphasis. So essentially, where you're looking at diagnosis and treatment, we try to prevent them from even happening for them before they can even see you. So today, in today's case study of JT, what we're going to focus on is the PCP's dismissal of JT's concern. So the PCP basically dismissed JT's concern as, you know, consequence of prior surgery, and that has left JT worried. Now, with PCP's dismissal, it falls under what we consider basically structural racism in healthcare. Now, as Black women, African-American women, we are disproportionately affected by multiple sexual and reproductive health conditions compared with other women of other races. Research suggests that the social determinants of health, including poverty, unemployment, and limited education, contribute to health disparities. However, racism is a probable underlying determinant of these social conditions. Now, if we take a look at the social ecological model, as is shown here, it demonstrates how social determinants grounded in racism after an individual behaviors and interpersonal relationships, which may contribute to sexual and reproductive health outcomes. So we think about JT, she's worried. She just had a new sexual partner. And based on the stereotypes that have been in place, she's now internalizing that and she may be thinking that she has an SDI. But her provider dismisses her. Now the provider dismissing her may be part of cultural competency because we know um, Black women, when it comes to reproductive health care, they most likely are the ones to be dismissed when they bring their concerns up. Um, this model also provides a perspective to understand how these unique contextual experiences are intertwined with the daily lived experiences of Black women and how they are potentially linked to post-sexual and reproductive health outcomes. So we also have some additional public health concerns. We need to develop screening tools, have screening tools for social determinants of health. There is one um, as part of a national effort to help health centers and other providers collect data needed to better understand and act on patients' social determinants of health. So that's a protocol for responding to and assessing patients' as assess risk and experiences that's prepared. Now, we also need to include questions on perceptions of stress, isolation, and mental health. We also need to screen for anxiety, depression, due to worrying from symptoms. So JT, JT may, you know, start having anxiety attacks, might become depressed because she's worried and her provider basically dismiss her. Um, also, we need to inquire about social support around pelvic organ prolapse or sexual health for older women more broadly. So JT may not have someone at home to help her with her exercises. She may not have the resources as well to get those, um, the tools that's necessary to help with her pelvic organ prolapse. So we hope that you consider all of this as we discuss our case study together. Thank you very much. Wow, we're right on time. Great job, everyone. Please give a round of applause to yourself and everyone who presented. We learned not only what to do, but also what not to do, such as, you know, like not dismiss patient symptoms and complaints. So now we're going to move on to the discussion. So each uh, group in the table, we're going to start discussing uh, the case. And we're going to have Professor Farad um, moderate the questions uh, later. First, we want to give you some time to discuss the case, look at these questions, 
answer with each other, talk about it, and then we're going to have some time to answer these questions, and Farad will help uh, with this process. All right, so let's start. Those who are present here, you can start working on your table. Whoever is online, you have your uh, group for breakout rooms. Please, if you do not remember your group you're in, just shoot us a message and we will let you know. All right, thank you, everyone. So while we were discussing these questions, also keep in mind whoever is going to, you know, like want to answer these questions, you know, to be prepared and just answer the questions. We, um, we have like 20 minutes for this and uh, yeah, have fun.
Hi, I don't know if you guys. The word volume, please. The volume. Lower that volume, please. I need to talk to them. Hi, guys in the Zoom. I do not know who Galaxy S21 is.
Okay, we will resume in 10 minutes, okay? Discuss for 10 more minutes and then we'll start.
All right. So we're going to enter the, the table work, the question. So each table, you have the microphone. And um, so whenever that you guys decide to give your viewpoint of, uh, please just use the microphone and, and, um, and respond. The notion of the table work and question is not necessarily um, just coming up with the right answer, but rather than it should be byproduct of what would be student perspective are in terms of the, those provoking questions that we ask. If we, we want to have as much of the contribution from all of the students, so we kind of like um, ask question from a different table. If your group have anything to add up of the information, please share it with us. So hopefully that we should be um, uh, finishing up the event in a timely manner. So let's look at the first one, which what are your top three concerns? So let's just start with the um, table one. So what would you think that the three concerns that you have with this particular case? Pick, pick up the phone. Oh, you don't have a mic? No. Right. <laughs> uh, thank you. So our top three concerns for this patient were um, the pelvic prolapse. We also want to consider their lower back pain. And then, most importantly, uh, the fact that they're Turn on the mic. Test. Yes. Okay, um, so one of the things we wanted to add to the concerns was that we were asking amongst ourselves, um, was there any occupational therapy, physical therapy follow-up um, after her original surgery? Um, we didn't really know for certain if that was part of her, her care um, package, basically. Um, and also, as, we, as you miss, already mentioned, um, that she was dismissed prior, so the fact that uh, she had already expressed these um, issues, but it was a, a continuation of the symptoms. So there were prior symptoms and it still wasn't addressed. Um, uh, and we also talked about how gender and race were playing into her experiences in patient um, care. So basically provider biases. Any other table? Hello? Oh, okay. Um, we also brought up um, maybe um, so with the symptoms that she stated, it maybe if it would be a STI infection or a urinary, being that she had low back pain and um, complaints with um, urinating after sex. Any other table? Okay. So we were discussing that um, there needs to be response to the patient's symptoms as best as possible to improve quality of life and prevent further health issues and also ensure the patient has access to health education material regarding present diagnosis, including management of symptoms and prevention of recurrence. Also encouraging good communication between all medical personnel involved, example, the specialists and the general practitioner. Thank you. Testing, testing. Oh, wait, I, I think I did. Okay, so our group, we discussed that um, one major concern could be because of her age group that um, 
this population may be overlooked in terms of being sexually active um, because she may either not, um, she may either seem like she knows what she's doing, um, so she may not need certain kind of education. Um, we also mentioned that because the problem lingered in, the problem lingered for six months, um, the doctor could have probably just overlooked that for that reason as well, dismissing her concerns. Um, that's about it. Thank you. Anything from the virtual online? Do we have any concern? All right. Any other concern? Um, right. There's a group, too. I don't know if you can hear me. Can you hear me? Yes. So this is group two, and we discussed uh, possible education that this patient needs. Uh, because, like, we all see the um, you know, Instagram influencers who uh, promote uh, physical activities for, um, you know, health, and we sometimes blindly follow them. But... Um, uh, there are uh, multiple materials, scholarly articles that support uh, the evidence that um, physical high intensity physical activities and especially so popular plank exercise can contribute to the um, development of the um, uh, pelvic organ prolapse as well as worsening of the early stage one. So this patient has to be um, educated about following the uh, professional advice and not the uh, self-proclaimed you know, Instagram um, gurus. That's one thing. And another thing I was, um, because we discussed the possibility of using pessaries for the uh, sister seal, there are also a possibility of adverse complication, which was not mentioned, uh, such as vesica vaginal fistula, uh, recta vaginal fistula, vaginal impaction, and other uh, things, even some cases of cancer. And the patient has to be educated how to um, correctly insert it, how to correctly remove it, and um, pay attention to the symptoms that might be indicative of uh, upcoming complication and report it immediately. That's I, what we Thank you very about. much. Let's look at the second question. Right. How can each discipline foster communication with uh, with each other to provide the best care for our patient. So let's have the group three haven't said anything in that. Well, one of you has said that. But let's see what the group three would suggest to respond for this question. Um, so in our field as a health informatician, I would say in the patient's discharge planning, we would involve ensuring a smooth transition from the hospital to returning home. This is done by facilitating an exchange of relevant health information between healthcare personnel, updating electronic health records with the most recent medical evaluation and treatment plans, and coordinating any necessary follow-up appointments or referrals needed for this patient. Thank you. Any other group? Just to add another, two other things we discussed. We talked like when a patient is being seen by a healthcare provider, it's like going to be a team. So you'll have like a physician, you'll have a nurse, you'll have the therapist, occupational therapist, and even sonographer there basically, or even someone, a public health practitioner. So it'll be like a multi-diverse team speaking to the patient. And we even looked at practical ways. So, for example, we were talking about, let's say we're looking at a survey, a social determinants of health survey that can be incorporated into the patient health record by the medical informatics team. Um, so, yeah, those are some ways we think we can foster communication between our different disciplines and patient, to improve patient care. Thank you. Any other group? Uh, I'm from Group mm -hmm. Two. I'm also from the Health Informatic Program. I was telling my uh, my table that uh, my recent uh, attendance in one of the health insurance, I mean, a uh, conference where they exhibit uh, exactly the kind of technology that are being used in facilitating this kind of uh, 
uh, you know, intercommunication between different teams and the kind of technology, uh, the format, for example, is called HL7, Fire. These are all related to interoperability between different systems. And this is a field that's pretty big in informatics where we work on to uh, utilize technology, developing technology platform to facilitate this kind of uh, discussions and communication. Thank you. Um, our group was discussing about how electronic health records helps us convey things that we may not be able to convey since we're not on a day-to-day -day basis interacting with each other. So a detailed health record that we have with our interaction of the patient, like on the basis of ultrasound, we will properly document things on ultrasound imaging. And then any additional comments we have, we'll write in a preliminary report that will show up in the patient's electronic records or on the image itself. Thank you very much. Any other group? All right, so let's let's look at the question number three and four together because it's kind of like having the same type of the uh, scope. What is the broadest perspective on enhancing health in this patient population? And then number four, what advocacy is needed for this patient client, local, community-wide, and how does one we could uh, we could we access it? So let's. Uh, um, table number, I think, five. You guys are hiding in that corner. So let's see here what you guys think of. Um, I usually stop for the people that are ignoring me. So I'm going to have you to respond there. So talking about advocacy, I would like to go, we are nurses, right? So we need to stand in the gap for the, um, um, if it's a nurse, um, we need to stand in the gap for um, JT. Um, here was a case where um, patient um, concern wasn't really addressed, you know, by the care, um, primary care provider. So nurses can advocate for um, this um, JT so that, the, um, so that the actual problem can be addressed. Also, um, we have okay. So, um, social services can also come in place. Also, um, help um, collaborate patients' care um, by helping you know provide facilities. Um, Um, one of the things we also mentioned, like, ideally you have a place like a community health center or something that people can go to um, that have providers that can do collaborative relationships um, to help care for uh, people in the community. And if, if the challenge is also getting people to come in to access care, to know uh, that um, you're there to to help in different ways. Maybe you can also go out into the community. So some of that could be, you know, campaigns, whether it's like PAP Day or um, what were some other days that you're talking about? I don't know, like um, STI education, basically just going out in the community and to start talking about different things that may be um, uh, issues that people in the community are dealing with. You can also get out of your own facility and then, you know, even start, um, you know, little community groups like seniors, seniors and sex. I don't know what it is, uh, but like at a library, you know, public library or, or other facilities that people possibly go to, you'll have flyers out there so that people know that one, you exist, that you're open to having these conversations. Um, and then you're kind of building communities where, where discussions of things that may be, things people are going through, but they don't feel always, they don't know that that it's okay to talk about, right, with, with certain people and that it might draw people that are dealing with some of them um, together. Thank you very much. Any other table that have any suggestion in addition to what has been mentioned? I mean, if you guys have a microphone, you could go ahead and talk about it. Okay. Um, our group also mentioned support groups, helplines, um, social media um, that can educate the public on certain things, diagnoses, uh, symptoms to look out for. Um, also churches and community centers, especially churches because, you know, we 
the community, the population that's in the churches may not be privy to certain um, diagnoses or certain symptoms. Um, what else can we talk? And also, special, especially support groups to normalize just talking about certain things, um, having comfortable conversations, specifically with JT. If she's involved in a support group, it'll let her know that she's not alone, give her the, um, the floor to just express certain things that she's been going through, and just make it more normal to talk about. Thank you. Uh, okay, so some of this um, kind of come back, comes back to one of the things that was raised earlier. Um, but for us, we were talking about health promotion improvement, um, the fact that we need to better target um, older adults for specialized um, education in, in continuing their sexual health lives. Um, and also the reality that you need additional tools um, when you're being sexually active at that age. Um, so, for example, um, sex therapy um, exists as a part of maintaining your mental and physical well-being when it comes to um, sexual health practices. Um, so that would be something worth um, implementing on a broader scale um, for older patients who are sexually active. Um, also coming back to provider biases. Um, so what kind of information are we um, normalizing as being necessary to um, give our patients with regards to um, you know, health practices or, for example, the medication that she is um, using and the fact that it has um, a way of contributing to experiencing prolapse. Um, so like, did she provide, did she experience guidance for that? Um, so improving provider um, ability to communicate to their patients and to provide them with the right information to make um, useful choices for their lives. Thank you. Any other table? Do we have any comment from the, our online participant? All right, so let's look at the um, uh, question number five. What facility exists to help patient client with the special problem and the issues that we mentioned that and how can patient and client access them? So maybe table number two that could start the conversation. Not the table two, um, any table. I'm one here. All right, go ahead. So this was kind of already mentioned before by table seven, um, because we were talking about the same thing. Um, we spoke about support groups and appropriate support groups, or maybe she just needs a support person to talk about these things to, with. But we also talked about a lot of feelings of guilt because she had the surgery when she was 53 and then she lost her husband at 55 and then has a new relationship at 58. And since she's having these issues every time she has sex, she could be feeling guilty of having a new partner now. So I think that's an important topic to think about. Um, and also just, we also spoke about maybe she could have been referred to a sex therapist as well to help her deal with these feelings and also to learn how to prepare herself for these new experiences in her life. Thank you. Any other table? Hello. Our online people. Oh. Okay. Go ahead. about um, referring to like, um, women's um, co clinics, um, community health cares, um, um, education, um, referring to social works. Because um, uh, with the patient, we, you know, we're, we have to look at the whole scope, um, where she lives, her community, um, the support that she has. So there may be... Um, Issues maybe with um, getting the right insurance, um, looking at her social determinant of health, and um, basically um, collaborating with outside help, like I said, with social work and um, getting her education. Thank you. Any other table? Online people? All right, so let's... Um, 
look at the last one, which is uh, any new item you discuss and um, and what did we miss? So th- among the conversation that you have, anything that you just kind of like have discussion that we didn't talk about it and you feel important about it to talk about it. You guys. So um, one thing that my group talked about is, so I think a lot of times when we think about health, we think about more so from a physical standpoint, um, where we kind of neglect the mental stamp, like state of mind of the patient. Um, so you think about this scenario, right? She's a middle-aged woman. She just lost her husband, so she's a widow. And she's now getting back into like the social scene. She's dating. Um, so is she ready, right? And um, just not neglecting the fact that she may still be grieving the loss of her husband and providing support, whether that's um, a therapist or a support group for her, we think would be very important so that, again, she doesn't feel alone in her experiences and she has like a network around her that she can consult in. Um, so, yeah, we thought that would be important. Um, we also spoke about if the PCP directed her to an OBGYN. Um, that was a main concern for us also. And we didn't see anywhere in there. We just kept seeing that she went to the PCP. She had these symptoms. She went back to the PCP. Um, so we were just wondering, like, why didn't he try to direct her anywhere else? Even if some insurances I know might not, you know, cover it or you might need a referral for an OBGYN. I think there should have been a chain of command type of thing where they directed her to an OBGYN. And if she was unsure if she needed a referral, they then direct her to the front staff. And I just didn't see that happening. And I think maybe could have got solved quicker if she did, you know, go see an OBGYN um, and not just a PCP. Thank you. Any other suggestion from any other table? Well, I'm from table. Regard, I think we discussed very briefly about the role of case management in the community is that, that you have a nurse uh, who work with the patient, develop a long-term relationship, who knows the patient well, and who can be a facilitator, kind of like a traffic control person that would direct her to different resources. So that could be helpful, I think. Any other suggestion? With that said, all great suggestion, great response. Thank you very much. I'll hand it to Well, I'm really impressed. I think you guys did an amazing job. You really, really got into it and really looked in places that um, are often overlooked to help somebody Again, improve her quality of life in the present and also potentially uh, prevent both physical and mental health challenges and uh, challenges for our activities of daily living and her own intimate experience with her new partner and her opportunity to experience pleasure in her life. Um, Thank you for taking it really seriously. We really appreciate everything that you brought to it. And I'd like to ask the committee members, if you're not already standing, please just stand up. I've really enjoyed sharing the committee this this year. And the dean introduced everybody. There's Mr. Bones back there. Vanetta, Farad, where are you hiding? Adi. There we go. So this is our committee. And and, um, thank you so much for participating. I hope for those of you who are still uh, in school next year that you'll come back and join us again. Online people, thank you.